Testing one, two.
namo tassa bhagavato arahato samha sambuddhassa Homage to the blessed, noble, and perfectly enlightened one. Namo sadanto suche doye lahudi san miao san putoshi. Wu shang shen shen wei miao fa. Bai Chen Wan Jie Nan Zao Yu Wo Jin Chen Wan De Shou Chi Yan Jie Ru Lai Zhen Shi Yi The unsurpassed, deep, profound <coughs> in a hundred thousand million eons is difficult to encounter. Now that I've come to receive and hold it within my sight and hearing, I bow to fathom the thus come one's true and actual meaning. Shri Fu Shang Ren, Kui Shri Shung Daji Omito Fu, Venerable Master, Dhamma Friends, welcome to our Sutra Lecture. Tonight, as we begin, there are more people online than there are physically here. That's um, probably a, a, it's a sign of progress. Whether or not it's the direction we want to go in, that's another question. But that's the case. So, welcome everybody. 抱歉，我们就用英文讲，不用中文讲，请您往上啊。大家可以把这个当一个学习英文的一个机会啊，一边看佛法一边听英文哈。So our lecture will be in English tonight, and uh, a little bit hampered because, uh, as da Master Dashing uh, eloquently pointed out, I am short wisdom. I am deficient in wisdom tonight by the tune of one tooth, and. <coughs> Lost a wisdom tooth today, and it's uh, it's only pain. You know that's the good thing about it. It only hurts. It's not symptomatic of anything deeper, but it's certainly uh, left a gap, and there's a bunch of stitches in there. And we're going to stop a little early tonight, and uh, I may not make it up to CTTB tomorrow. I'm not so sure, but uh, it's uh, sure it makes you humble and puts you in touch with your body. It's good. It reminds you of tonight's, uh, tonight's topic. So, uh, let's see if I can get that pill down. How do you sip on the left side? That's kind of hard. Mm. Okay, we're going to begin by uh, chanting the title of the text. It's on the front cover. Please join if you care to do so. Namo da fang guang fu yen jing hua yen hai o pu sa namo da fang hua yen jing hua yen hai hui O pu sa na mo da pa Hua yen jing hua yen hai O pu sa na mo da pa Guang fu hua yen jing hua yen hai hui O pu sa na ta fang guang fu en jing hua yen hai hui O pu sa na ta fang guang fu hua yen jing hua yen hai hui O pu sa na mo da Wang po hua yen ji Hua yen hai wei po pu sa
My goodness, our balcony is a popular place to be tonight. It's, it's happening upstairs. You guys are missing out down, down below. So appreciate the translation into Vietnamese that Mai is providing. And, uh, so let's see. We are down at the bottom of our text, page 38 and 39 at the very bottom. Last line. We need a Mandarin balcony. We have a Vietnamese balcony. We should have a Chinese balcony. Put in a new balcony. Okay, down at the very bottom. Here we go. (laughs) For zi, zi pu sa mo ho sa. Fu zuo shi nian, zi ju fan fu, yi zhi wu zhi, shen wei ke min, ke min, you wu shu shen yi mie, jin mie dang mie, ru shi jin mie, 不能与神而生厌想转更增长机关苦事机关苦事 Okay, hold on. Over back to page 39, please turn back. Shall we read together in unison? Here we go. Together, Disciples of the Buddha these bodhisattva mahasattvas, I'm sorry, ma, uh, my mistake, sorry, sorry, I did the wrong, the wrong pronoun. Here we go. Together, disciples of the Buddha, this bodhisattva, mahasattva, further makes the following reflection. All these foolish common people are stupid and lack wisdom and are deeply pitiable. They have countless bodies which have already perished, are now perishing and will perish in the future. Yet even though they ultimately perish in that way, still they have no thought of growing tired of these bodies. They perpetually increase these contrived instances of suffering. Stop there. Good. Okay. Oh, now the varsity translator has arrived. We have two varsity translators in the in the balcony. I'm giving you all downstairs the byplay from up above. If you want to hear of two Vietnamese translations, this is your chance. So uh, okay, let's do it this way. My you translate in a Mandarin and Guo Hong, you do the Vietnamese. How's that? Okay. I you fail. Oh and that's okay. No no no. You're learning. You're learning. It's not failure. Okay. Uh, we will do our but this is a very apt passage for my situation tonight. This is the Ten Grounds chapter of the Flower Garland Sutra. Flower Garland Sutra is uh, the uh, sutra in the Mahayana tradition that talks about the Bodhisattva, this awakened being. And it describes how a generic Bodhisattva behaves. It's not anybody with a name. It's not Restore or Guan Yin or Manjushri or Samantabhadra. It's a bodhisattva who has climbed to the fifth stage, the fifth ground. And this person is very, very good at meditating. They're a master at calming and purifying their body and their mind. And this text describes what happens when they do that. What are the results of that kind of practice? And our bodhisattva here is um, he has seen through the illusion of a separated me, a different me that's special and unique. He doesn't believe that anymore because he actually sees through through hard work and deep analysis, the, the illusion of the self. It's not that the self 
stops existing. It doesn't cease to exist. He just isn't ruled by it anymore. He doesn't believe he's the center of the universe. Uh, as a result, he, he doesn't give up. He doesn't feel um, despair. He doesn't feel uh, a kind of uh, anomi. He doesn't give up. Instead, what happens, we'd, we'd like to invite everybody to take a bench, please, instead of sitting in the back. Please help yourself. We've got lots in front. If you sit in the back, everybody will trip over you coming down. There you go. Thank you. It's also warmer. By the way, we turn the heat on. There will be heat soon. Guaranteed that you will be toasty warm. There we go. Thank you. You also get a book that way. You get a text. Page 38 and 39. Now, somebody might say, as you go, as you see through the self, uh, that you get to a place where nothing matters. You get kind of, uh, what would you say? You, get, uh, you fall into an emptiness, a state of, of despair, a state of uh, uh, a kind of antisocial uh, dullness. And it's not the case. That doesn't happen. It's, it's not the case. It's what happens to the bodhisattva. Instead, the, the more he is able to drop the self, what replaces it is a sense of connection, is a sense of identity. He sees the connection between himself and not just people, but everybody, everything, every sentient creature he sees as family. Big deal. That's a really big deal. That makes a huge difference in his motivation for getting out of bed in the morning. And he looks out and he says, yeah, we're, I'm really the same as everybody. The earth, air, fire, and water in my body, I'm the same. The feelings, the thoughts inside, are, they're more the same than they are different. And once he makes this connection, what does he notice? He notices that people suffer a lot. People go through confusion. They go through uh, heartbreak. They go through terrifying threats to their body and life. Um, the latest prediction in the Philippines is maybe 10,000 dead. I just saw a photograph from the space station of the storm over Leyte, the Philippine island. And it's, you can't imagine that, that that's a, it looks like a living thing it, it's huge. It's, the picture is taken from space and the storm the clouds are just covering like a very thick blanket, a huge chunk of the planet, of the globe. And there are people underneath, there are people down below who are trying to, uh, trying to survive, trying to make it through the night. So how difficult. Bodhisattva sees that, feels it, and wants to make a difference, wants to do something. So this is, that's where it takes us. That's where we are right now. And so um, there's some harsh language tonight. And we'll see, we'll see why he says what he says. What does the Bodhisattva say? Bodhisattva Mahasattva makes the following reflection. This awakened being, he thinks, makes the following reflection means this thought occurs. The sutra takes us right into the mind, the thinking place in the Bodhisattva. And he says, all these foolish common people, we decided last week that that's a pretty unhelpful translation. We got ordinary last week. We came up with these translations. Normal, average. Now, what does the Chinese say? The Chinese says, zi zhu fan fu, Fanfu is means somebody who doesn't have wisdom, somebody who believes in things the way they aren't and really believes in them, somebody who is convinced that they are, for example, the center of the whole world. They learned that when they were infants. Uh, mommy raised me that way. Mommy made sure that every time I cried, she picked me up. Every time I was hungry, she fed me. Every time I skinned my knee, she 
gave it a kiss to make it hurt less, you know. And some people never advance beyond that, that they grow up thinking that is the case, that they are indeed the center of the universe and their needs are the most important thing. Um, the Bodhisattva has gone beyond that view. And he says, Fanfu, ordinary people, have not. These are people who strongly believe that the only thing that matters is what's going on inside their nervous system. Okay? Nothing else matters. So that's what it means, foolish, common, mm, maybe ordinary people. Fanfu, people lacking wisdom. What does it say? It goes, yichi, wuzhi. They are ignorant, they don't have any wisdom. Ignorant, yichi, here. Would, what's, what would a, a yichi person be? That's somebody who doesn't believe in cause and effect. Who thinks that when you plant a seed that it's not going to grow. And maybe after being told that, they still don't believe it. Maybe after being told repeatedly, they still don't believe it. That's yichi. Someone who thinks that effects happen without cause. If I kill somebody, if nobody knows, I get away with it. If I lie to somebody and nobody knows, I get away with it. That's yichi. What does the wise person know? The, you know what they say? There's this great phrase in the Mahayana. They say, ordinary people are afraid of results, but don't care about the causes. The bodhisattvas are very cautious when planting causes but not at all afraid of results. Okay, that's a beautiful parallel. The ordinary person doesn't pay any attention when they kill, steal, lust, lie, drug themselves. But when the results come, it's like, oh, how could this happen? Oh, me, unfair. Why are you treating me like this? Right? They don't connect the responsibility for what happens to them, to the causes that, that created it. So, as a result, they're careless at the start, but when the results come, big deal. Now, a bodhisattva is the opposite. They know that causes bring about results. They're totally believers in cause and effect. So, when they're doing things, they're really, really careful. But when the results come, they're delighted because they planted carefully. They're happy with the result. So, that's a beautiful parallel. A person who is yichu, wujir, doesn't connect cause and effect. They think that uh, the, they, the body, mouth, and mind, the most potent forces in creating karma, they, they pay no attention to. They don't realize their power. Shen wei ku min. They are very, uh, they are to be pitied. They're really pathetic. That's, that would be a good English translation. They're really pathetic. Shen wei ku min. How pathetic are these people? Because they hurt a lot, but they don't have the wisdom to make it hurt less. They don't, they don't see how to make it hurt less. Yo wushu shen yi mie. Okay, here's a, here's a uh, sequence. Take a look here. Wushu shen yi mie, jin mie, dang mie. They have no numbering beyond numbering bodies which have already mia gone bad, died, are now dying or will die. Okay, past, present, and future, talking about the body. They have all these bodies beyond numbering that have died, that are dying now, and that will die. Ru shi jin mie, bu nang yu shen er sheng yan xiang. And as this process happens, as the bodies die, they never think this is yin, despicable, disgusting, pathetic, sad, um, miserable, right? And in the midst of all this dying of their body, they never at any point think to let it go. They never think to try to do anything about it. They never develop distaste. There you go. They never feel distaste for this process. Okay? So, okay, 
let's stop right there and take a look at what's being said. This is pretty interesting because it's a radical approach to your body that is not part of our cultural understanding. Our cultural understanding is the body is a temple. We want to make it as comfortable as possible. It's something to be beautified. It's something to be treasured. We all want to look 20 years old. So we buy all this, the products in the shelves at Walgreens. Counter after counter of ways to to do the opposite of what the sutra, well, do exactly what the sutra says, which is living beings never think. We never think that the body is not such a great thing, not such a deal. Okay, what about the statement that we have died, are dying now, or will die numberless times, times beyond numbering? That, that's a claim, isn't it? So, you believe it? Is that true? Anybody who remembers dying in the past? It's interesting. We, we went over this a couple of weeks ago, that reincarnation, the idea that we have uh, lived before and will live again, used to be part of Christian theology, Jewish theology. It was part of the biblical teachings. It was a teaching in the Bible. And then at a certain point, it stopped being. It was removed from the Christian theology. There are libraries written about the reasons why and libraries full of books written about the reasons why. But in general, uh, it didn't jibe with the teaching that has become standard Christian theology about salvation through Jesus. Nonetheless, it was there. Um, Lots and lots and lots of people in the world take reincarnation as just as predictable as the sun rising tomorrow in the east. Right? If the sun rises over the Golden Gate Bridge tomorrow, give me a call. All right? Let me know because I want to get my camera out and uh, geotag it and say, hey, look. Um, it's not likely to happen. It does the, uh, that's a given that with the rotation of the earth on its axis around the sun, we will see the sun, we're going to turn into, the sun doesn't move, mind you, right? We're going, we're going like this, and we're also going like this, going like this. All right, so we're going like this. Round, 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 round. And as we do this around the sun that's there, we turn into the sun every time. It's just as reliable as as uh, gravity you know, is our simple proof of, of physical law. Something falls when we drop it. So, <coughs> so, that's for sure. And we just don't question that, right? Many, many, many people in the world say we die and come back just the same. It's the same kind of law. That things that are in motion tend to stay in motion. Okay, there's a physical law. Where's another one? Matter turns to energy, energy turns to matter. Right? Newtonian physics, Newton, gave us these laws that you could use water. You heat it up, it comes out of the tea kettle, you catch it in a glass bowl inverted, you can see it beat up, it drips down, becomes water again, turns to steam, turns to water, turns to steam, turns to water. Um, Matter and energy transform in the same way. So, why would humans be different? We obviously recycle our bodies. We compost our bodies, right? They go away, turn to worms, turn to topsoil, go back. Um, What about the thing inside? That's the interesting question, right? There is something inside us that, does it go away? Does it come back? Where does that thing go? with the thing with so many names? Good question. And once you've you've ever thought about that, you're on the same path that the prince took to become a Buddha over time. He was asking himself those questions all of a sudden, and he was using his superior intelligence to try to find an answer to those fundamental questions. So, the ignorant people the Bodhisattva is talking about 
don't ask those questions. They live as if this were the only time around and they're going to live forever. They don't question it. They don't even ponder it. And the fact that as we are sitting here, we are aging, as soon as we're born, we're on the way to death, is, what do we call that? We call that morbid, right? We call that pessimistic. We call that too Buddhist. You Buddhists, all suffering all the time. Get happy, get a life. So we really do uh, try to hide that fact that we're dying as we sit here. Not, and, and is that a bad thing? Right away you think death is negative. The Buddha's response would be, no, it's natural. It's reality. That's the way things are. Try to stop it. Don't die now, okay? Please, just stop breathing. Stop pumping your blood. Stop your metabolism. Not going to happen, right? So every engine does, goes through four stages. Intake, compression, power, exhaust. Intake, compression, power, exhaust. Engines do that. Right? You think of the cylinders in your car, which I don't know if you ever thought about your car. It's got these valves, unless it's fuel injection or a diesel, right? But if it's an old internal combustion engine, valve opens, gasoline and air come in, closes, spark, boom, turns the crankshaft, this valve opens, whew, out comes the exhaust. The car runs down the road. Our bodies are too. Every time there is combustion, every time you burn any fuel, there's exhaust. And it comes out of our bodies in waste products. So, that's on the road to death, says the Bodhisattva here. And he says, living beings don't concern themselves with it. We simply pursue pleasure, run from pain. Pursue pleasure, run from pain. Pursue pleasure, run from pain. That's mostly the story of our lives. So, uh, he says, how sad, because this is the heart of the Buddha's teaching, which is, he said, is that all there is? Is that the end of the story? Me too, question mark, he said. Is that all, or is that, is that all you got? Do I have any choices, said the Buddha, said the prince, right? And his whole story from the time he saw the messengers at uh, the four, three gates of the city and then saw the fourth messenger, the cultivator, the, cult, the practitioner. From that moment on, his story is the answer to that question. Yes, there is something to do about it. Yes, there is an answer. There is a choice. You don't have to necessarily simply roll over at the time of death. Okay. So, they have countless bodies which have already perished or now perishing and will perish in the future. And be, even though they all perish in the same way, they have no thought of growing tired of those bodies. Okay, this is key. 不能一生而生厌想, it says. These living beings seem to be unable to have any thought of dislike for this process, in the middle of this. And that's key. You know the phrase, if you want to get well, the first thing is you have to get sick of being sick. You have to really want to not be sick before you actually get well. And you could preface that by saying you have to recognize that you're sick to begin with before you can start thinking, I don't want to be sick anymore. And there's the first noble truth. The problem with the first noble truth is if you're talking to ordinary folks, let's say a class of sixth graders, and you're the Buddhist, and here are the sixth graders, you know, who are like, they're coming for their world's religions encounter day. And you say, you realize that you're all suffering you're going to get old, you're going to get sick, you're going to die. You realize you're going to be grieving and sorrowful and painful and miserable and you're coming back to do it all over again? You know, and the kids go, <laughs> Why, why, uh, you're so depressed. 
you know, pessimistic. Is that abuse? Can you be arrested for saying those things? This is Bay Area, after all. So, it, like, sixth graders aren't anywhere close to being able to recognize that. But what about 60-year-olds? At what point do we say, uh, you know, I notice that I'm kind of like, my reflexes are slower. I can't put my chin to my toe the way I used to be able to. I can't go up the stairs without breathing hard. You know, I've been having to pee a lot more frequently these days, you know. The prostate, you know, it's like the body starts to wear out. And you go, what's going on with this? I, same old, I don't feel any different, but something's going on. I'm getting older. Right? We see that, and kids don't. So, here are the Buddhists. At what point do you say the first noble truth really makes sense? I think everybody has a different threshold. Some people see it right away. Um, I have uh, one of those moments when I had a Siamese cat. And no, this is not this is not Simba. This was Katie. Katie is my gray American short hair. I think you've seen pictures of Katie the cat. And Katie, uh, gee, we are running out of seats up in the balcony. This is great. There are plenty of seats down below. Anybody wants to come down downstairs? Um, Katie the cat uh, was um, a good birder, as cats will do. And in Ohio, we had blue jays, not the California jays, but we had uh, Great Lakes blue jays. And these Great Lakes blue jays were fierce. They were organized, and Katie picked on the wrong family of blue jays. And she, I think, might have gotten one or scared one. But the blue jays staked out my cat for retaliation. And we had a front door and we had a back door. And we had trees in front of the front door and the back door. And the blue jays set up sentries. And a tree in the front and a tree in the back. And Katie used to go outside to, uh, to do her business, right? We had a cat door. And every time she stuck her nose out the door, the blue jays went, rah, 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 and they would dive bomb her. They would come down and they would just smash her. And the poor cat, after a while, didn't dare go outside. She would just cross her legs and pace back and forth by the door, you know, not wanting to go out. We got her a cat box so that she could, you know, she didn't have to go out. And she, poor Katie. And this went on for a week, you know. Every time she stuck her nose out, the Blue Jays would dive bomb the cat because they were, te- you know, you're a marked cat, you know. <laughs> she probably got a black X in the mail or something, you know. There's a contract out for you, Kitty. And so what did I do? Well, I, you can't do that to my cat. So I took a slingshot and uh, I started stalking the Blue Jays. And I was Yuchu Wujir. Okay, fan fu, yu chi, which are the ordinary common person who is ignorant, lacking in wisdom. And I had ball bearings. And we, had, we were small houses, little 50 foot lots, so I had to be careful with my trajectory to make sure if I missed it didn't wind up in the neighbor's window. But I was, I, uh, was shooting, you know, it was a, a serious slingshot. And, uh, you know, and I hit a blue jay. And a blue jay went, Boom. It hit the ground so fast, it was clearly just dead. Boom. Hit the ground. And I went over, and it twitched about three times, you know, for, for my sake, and died right in front of me. And it was beautiful blue. I mean, there's no blue here as beautiful as that blue jay. It was just startlingly blue. And uh, so intelligent. You could see the intelligence in the bird. And all the other blue jays were completely silent as I went over to, to inspect what I'd shot, you know. And my heart sank. It just went, <gasps> sank as fast as the blue jay fell. And I realized I'd killed this thing. I felt so bad that... Um, with my actions, this, the life had gone out of this beautiful feathered blue thing, this creature that was 
doing its best to protect itself. It couldn't protect against the ball bearing that I was shooting. And man, I don't think I slept that night. I, all I could do is just see that I, I said I was sorry and I buried it and uh, sat there and I, you know, felt terrible that I'd killed a blue jay because the blue jay was harassing my cat. And uh, so I carry that to this day, you know, remembering that. I think I might have been 11 or 12. But um, that realization that that was my action that killed that bird stayed with me. And uh, what, what I learned in that experience was that even though the bird died, it was, uh, it hurt me. I, I didn't die, but it hurt me uh, all the same. That I knew I had marked myself somehow by that action because that was a dead, lifeless thing. I wasn't going to eat it. I didn't have to do it, um, but I did it. And it was, it wasn't insignificant. It wasn't trivial that that bird had died. There was something that happened there. I didn't have the language. I didn't have any understanding of what, what I had done, but it mattered that I had done that. So um, what ordinary living beings don't connect is that the suffering happens to the one who does it as much, does evil deeds as much as the, the receiver of the evil deeds. That invisibly you have planted a seed that will come back to you. So, what is it? He doesn't, in the midst of that procession, succession of births and deaths, he doesn't feel any revulsion for this body that we cling to. Instead, Zhuan Gong Zheng Zhang Qi Guan Ku Shi They perpetually increase these contrived instances of suffering. Terrible translation. Hey there, translation team. We got <laughs> we gotta work on that one. Perpetually increase contrived instances of suffering. What in the world could that ever mean to anybody? Right? Uh, I don't know how we let that one slip. So. Okay, let's take a look at the Chinese. Zhuan Gong Zheng Zhang. Instead, they increasingly successively increase Zhuan Gong is um, Lock, I think we got one down this, that's an available seat, right? Okay So they increase they increase Qi Guan Ku Shi Qi Guan is um, kind of um, formulaic these empty Mm, mechanical, almost. Ku uh, shi, instances, uh, moments of pain, these uh, painful circumstances, right? They increase these kind of almost like involuntary suffering. Sui sheng si liu bu neng huan fan. They flow along with birth and death and are unable to turn it back. They're unable to stop it. All right. Now, why is our Bodhisattva preoccupied with death? Those of you who were here a couple weeks ago will remember that um, the Bodhisattva was in his meditation looking at how things come about. Uh, lock, front front row here. There you go. Got it. Here I am, traffic manager. Yeah, cool. Because I can see everything going on there. There we go. So, the Bodhisattva in his meditation was able to see so deeply into his life, and he connected it to every life that he saw where things come from. He saw how things come into being and how they pass away. They come into being when conditions arise. They pass away when those conditions disperse. And that's what he saw. So he says, wow, you know, 
It's what people do that brings them back into being. And if they can stop the doing, they don't have to come into being. Because why? once they come into being, you know what happens? They pass away. And if we were totally cool with every change, no big deal. I'm dying, no problem. But we don't. We attach to everything. And our relationships attach to us. And as a result, as we die, people get really, really, really upset. Okay, I lost a tooth this morning. And it came out quickly, very professionally, very skillful. Dentist extracted a wisdom tooth and put in two stitches. And it hurts. <laughs> uh, ouch. And I, I'm carefully choosing every word because I don't want to say an extra one. Every time I swallow, it's going, oh, yeah. uh, And I'm, I'm told it's going to hurt worse tomorrow. <laughs> it's going to be sore. So, uh, and what could be, you know, tooth came out of my head. Like that. And it's going to heal for sure. It was well, well extracted, painlessly. But um, I'm totally in sympathy with people whose bodies break up because our nerves are aligned to move towards comfort and away from pain. And uh, I lost a piece of my jawbone. It's on the tooth. You can see it. I got the tooth. And it's like the body is all set to warn me. Oh, something's missing. You can feel that. Guess what? (coughs) And uh, that's the experience. So people... um, in these bodies, they go bad. They, they do. They break up and they go away. And it's painful. It's emotionally painful. It's physically painful. The bodhisattva's going, yeah, that's really what happens. Isn't that something? Why are we in this world that keeps breaking up? What do we do about it? We're in a broken world. Everything breaks up. Name me something that lasts. Well... Space lasts. Nirvana lasts. Suffering itself doesn't end. Living beings last, but they last in their coming and goingness, right? Change is what lasts. The fact that nothing stays the same. Bodhisattva steps back from the daily experience. He goes, take a look at the whole process. Look at this. Were you aware? And if you were, why are you trying so hard to pretend it's not happening? Now, can you do that gracefully without being like a malcontent, without being a, a, a wet dish rag at the towel, at, at a, what do you say, a wet blanket at the party? Can you be aware of that without being grim and scary and depressed and pessimistic and negative all the time? Yeah. The Buddha is not negative and pessimistic. He's realistic and he's compassionate. And he smiles all the time in the midst of that. But there's the challenge. It doesn't have to be extremes, which is, oh, it's not happening. No, no, I'm not dying. I'm younger than ever. Or, man, I'm going to die. What a bummer. Those are kind of the opposites, right? And so where is wisdom's path in the midst of that? Is there, is there a way to be aware of it without being knocked off balance by it? The way is called the Avatamsaka Flower Garland Sutra. That's what it's about. Here's the Bodhisattva who in his stillness, in her stillness, is totally tuned in to the reality of our lives. Which is what? We're deader than we were when we walked in the door. (laughs) That sounds horrible, right? We are closer to our end than we were five minutes ago. If you don't believe it, go take a shower. Put a drain, put a... a, basket filter down by your drain and watch what washes down as you shower, right? We lose millions of cells every shower. So I'm shorter by a tooth than I was yesterday. So that's the reality of it. And what do we do with that? How do we, uh, how do we find balance? Well, the Bodhisattva would say, first thing is recognize it. See it the way it is. Things as they are. What does he say? He says, 
，余诸冤债不求处理，不知有为四大毒蛇，不能拔出诸慢尖剑，不能熄灭贪恚痴火，不能破坏无命黑暗。不能干解爱欲大海，不求失利大圣导师，入魔亦愁林，与生死海中，唯觉观薄桃之所偏逆。偏逆。From the house of the skandhas, they don't seek escape. They do not know to be worried about or to fear the poisonous snakes of the four elements. They are unable to pluck out the arrows of arrogance and views. They are unable to extinguish the fire of greed, hatred, and stupidity. They are unable to demolish the darkness of ignorance. They are unable to dry up the great ocean of love and desire. They do not seek the great sage's gui- sage guide with the ten powers. They enter the dense forest of demons and tent. In the sea of birth and death, they are tossed about by the waves of awakenings and contemplations. Okay, here's one of those sections in the sutra where the Bodhisattva、um, reads a laundry list of ignorance. Here's this happens once or twice a chapter where the Bodhisattva just starts telling living beings, telling us where we are, telling us where we're really at, and this is rather poetic. He's using all these metaphors, all these natural imagery to describe what. Realities like. Compare this to other religious scriptures you've read. Anybody here familiar with the Bible? Both the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament, and the Gospel, the New Testament. They, there are profound moments of wisdom. In In the Bible, there's lots of historical accounts. There are many tales of、uh, the practices of the Israelites and their laws. And, but I don't remember a section where God or the prophets. Or the the、uh, the four great disciples, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, turn their analysis on humanity and talk about people in this depth with kindness. I don't think Patanjali's yoga aphorisms. I don't think. The Holy Quran does it either. My point now, somebody. I hope someone will tell me that I'm wrong and point out, show me the, the book and verse, chapter and verse where, I am wrong. My point is. This is a sacred scripture. The equivalent of, the Bible, for Christianity and Judaism, and Islam, people of the book. And it, makes its. Focus, you and me. It's us we're talking about. It's not saying praise Buddha, praise the Bodhisattvas, praise God. Not saying that. It's not focusing up above and saying, you the creature need to praise the Creator. Saying the Buddha's going, <laughs> the Creator goes, you're a mess. You, you're so sad. You're in trouble. Wake up. You know, look at what's happening to you. You're falling apart. Don't you see? It's the roles are reversed. It's in in theistic systems, the creature says God is great. God is good. God is the answers. God is all powerful. We want to go back. We want to be with Him, right? Here, the Creator is going. Dude, <laughs> time's running out. You're hurting a lot. What are you doing? You know, it's a little bit of a scold, but it's a scold the way、um, the 
the elder in the Lotus Sutra says, hey, do you realize your house is burning down? Do you feel the flames? You smell the smoke? You're going to get out of there? You're going to burn up? Right? There's one of the more vivid images in Buddhist sutras. And I really like that view of the creator, of, of the power figure. The Buddha is not a creator. That, that notion of the power figure as the lifeguard trying to get us out of the water because the sharks are swimming. Right? The fireman, the creator as fireman saying, come out of the house, now it's burning down. Right? The, uh, uh, the creator as traffic cop saying, don't enter where it says, don't, don't drive your car up the ramp that says, do not enter. Right? That's, not, that's an off-ramp. You're going up it. You're in trouble. The traffic cop. That's this notion of, of the, the power figure in Buddhism being someone who sees stuff the way they are, trying to wake us up because we see it the way it isn't. And we deeply believe that things are just fine. Saying, not fine. Things are not fine. You're imperfect, you're blind, you're upside down, you're confused, you're driving right up the off-ramp, you're in trouble. Right? That's, I mean, that's a creator you can believe in. Right? That's somebody you want to Listen to. He's not saying, praise me, because I'm all good and powerful. He's saying, you're in big trouble. Please wake up. Here's how. Interesting role reversal here. So, what are those images? It says, they're in the house of the skandhas. They don't seek escape. That came up last week, right? The skandhas, body, feelings, thoughts, activities, we call them and consciousness, the things that make up our personality, the things that cut us off from everybody else, the things that make us think we're separate, those are the skandhas. We get a set when we come in to the womb, we drop them when our spirit moves on at death. Those are the skandhas, body and mind. We're in a house of the skandhas and we don't try to get out. You say, what else? So, skandhas, trapped in the house of the skandhas. Two, we don't know to be worried about or fear the poisonous snakes of the four elements. Earth, air, fire, and water. Remove a tooth and you don't want to talk. Your mouth doesn't work. It hurts, right? That's the, the, the earth element. There it is. I held it in my hand, a little piece of my earth element. And the sutra calls them snakes, poisonous snakes, dusha. Um, I have lived with poisonous snakes. That's, that's an experience I had as a Buddhist. Where did I have my experience with poisonous snakes? It was in Liu Gui in Kaohsiung Xian in Taiwan, southern Taiwan. We live in the forest in southern Taiwan. And the, uh, we're in a, a house set uh, halfway, up a, halfway up a mountainside. And it's just carved out of the mountain. Otherwise, you know, if you turn your back on it, well, and people did. They turned their back on this house for about six years and they had to hack their way in with Lian to get to get there because it had just grown up and covered. The Taiwan, Kaohsiung Xian is so fertile that, you know, three crops a year of whatever you plant and the this house was just covered over. So we had to hack it out to make it livable. And of course, where there's forests like this, there's all kinds of critters. And among the critters in southern Taiwan are a large number of poisonous snakes. Little green ones called qing zhu she, green bamboo snakes, among the most poisonous. Bai bu she, 100 step snakes. After you're bitten, you have 100 steps, then you die. Uh-oh, 99, 98, 97, 96. Oh, oh, that was a 70 step snake. What do you know? <laughs> Look at that. Bargain. Huh? Then they have uh, uh, Yusanjie, the cobras, umbrella snakes, crates, and all these wonderful snakes in Taiwan. That they live there forever. That's where they live. That's their home. That's where you expect to find these wonderful snakes. But when people try to live there, the snakes are very happy to move right in with us. They don't care that it's your house. That's where they live. You built your house in their home. So what I learned was that I am actually a primate. Um, 
you, you can, on YouTube, you can see videos of monkeys reacting to snake attacks. And I saw this after the fact and I laughed because it's exactly what I did. The snake will go for the monkey and the monkey is able to propel themselves backwards through space <laughs> just to the, to the length of the snake. And the, snakes, you know, the snake launches out like this from its coil it, really fast and the monkey like that. The monkey isn't thinking. The monkey is reacting the way monkeys have reacted since there have been monkeys to the presence of snakes. We are hardwired to react against snakes. I would get up in the morning and I would turn the light on and start to step down from where I was meditating and I would be moving backwards through space before my eyes had focused on the snake in front of me. Something in my body saw and recognized poisonous snake and reacted before the message reached my brain that there's a poisonous snake there. It's just tung, like that. And it's like, oh, a snake, you know, as I was flying backwards. And this was true. I, something, and I felt it here. I would recognize poisonous snakes with my dantian as fast as or faster than my eyes. Didn't know why. Um, tested it out. Um, was coming around the corner. You've, I told you the story and showed you the pictures. The house, my house in Australia and found a, a huge python on, the, on the, my deck as I was running to get my book bag so I wouldn't be late for class. And I came around the corner and there... There it was, you know, six feet of it. And it looked at me right away, and I jumped, but it was different. And I looked for a while, wasn't poisonous. Wasn't poisonous. The, the python has very elongated, uh, exaggerated nostrils. They're great sense of smell. They're after rodents. And uh, their head is not triangular. And many, many poisonous snakes had triangular heads. And the next snake in Australia is poisonous. The, the Australia has plenty of poisonous snakes. This is not one of them. And I looked and it was like, it just the snakiness of it got me, but it wasn't, it wasn't lethal. It wasn't like, this is dangerous, the way the snakes in Taiwan are, even the little ones. So it turns out that the pythons, they, they you know, uh, Aussies who are in the know love to put them around their necks and scare people, you know. Come pet my python, you know, and these big snakes. So they're, they're the farmer's friends because they eat rodents. Anyway, my body didn't react the same way as it did to the poisonous snake. And it's funny. I mean, I didn't know that I had a snake reaction hardwire system software all built into my body that's already there until I lived, in, lived with poisonous snakes. So, um, interestingly enough, nobody, no, none of the monks were ever bitten down there. And uh, the snakes are gone, somehow. Um, I'll never forget the morning when I lifted the toilet seat and was about to sit down and the snake came up out of the bowl. <laughs> <laughs> Glad I saw you before I sat down. Oh, ouch. <laughs> I've been, oh no, <laughs> bitten by a, oh no. So, um, the, four, the poisonous snakes are the four elements there to bite you. And if you're bitten by a poisonous snake, oh, it hurts. Oh, it is no fun. Rattlesnakes bite is not fatal unless you're a kid. Um, but... You don't want to be bitten by a snake. And in Australia, which is, you know, worse than Taiwan in terms of poisonous snakes, um, they have had very few deaths, knock on wood, in Australia recently because the anti-venom uh, serum is widespread. And you can pretty much get to a hospital in time if you're in the populated parts of Australia, if you're out back, you're on your own. You better carry your own anti, anti-toxin, anti-poison serum. 
Um, people do. Um, but in uh, where we are, there's uh, the, the snakes are so prevalent that they just have to stock up and everywhere. The doctors and clinics and hospitals are ready when the people come in having been snake bit. So they don't know to be worried about or to fear the poisonous snakes of the four elements. Earth, air, fire, and water, when they go away, it's as if you're bitten. They will bite you and you'll die. You'll be very miserable. They can't pluck out the arrows of arrogance and views. Arrogance and views. Arrogance is feeling yourself to be superior to others. I think, to be fair, how many arrogant people do you know compared to people who have low self-esteem who you know? I think you have to use both thinking you're better than and thinking you're worse than to do it, to round it out. Both of them are an affliction in equal measure. Why? They're both based on a view of self that is broken from others. This notion that my unit is separate, distinct, equal, valuable, important, unique, the center, the one that counts. That view, that's not the way it is, but the marketplace would have you believe that, so you reach for your credit card to pay for the stuff that reinforces that view of you as separate, unique. Right? Starbucks. You know that Starbucks has a hidden menu? Secret menu? Were you aware of that? If you go into Starbucks and ask for the secret menu, they'll give you the special combinations. I was reading on uh, salon.com about the uh, the item they published, the Starbucks secret menu. And it's, it's no different than the regular menu. It's just different combinations they don't advertise. So you can get extra, th extra thick, double whip, two shot, multi mocha, you know, protein powder, soy frap, all at once. Decaf espresso. Decaf espresso. That's kind of like saying white ketchup, you know. <laughs> really? Seriously? I like a double decaf espresso. <laughs> right. Don't make me smile, it hurts, all right? Don't joke. So you ask for the secret menu at Starbucks and the hip barista will tell you whether or not you can order today from the secret menu. Did you know that if you get a strawberry smoothie, they're only one size, but they, you can ask for the protein powder in the strawberry smoothie. The only problem, it's made from whey. What is whey? It's a milk product, a milk byproduct. So if you want the strawberry smoothie, then a very hip barista will look at you and go, you know that the whey powder is not vegetarian. It's not vegan. So I say, don't tell me about it. Put it in the glass. I don't want to hear about it. So strawberry smoothie, good choice. It's uh, one, you have to make it with soy milk. That's the secret menu. Could I have a strawberry smoothie with no protein powder and soy milk and a banana? You go, coming up. Can I, what's your name, sir? <laughs> Monk. Right. Okay. Pluck out the arrows of arrogance and views. A view is a way of seeing things that is not the way it is. We've been talking about it. Okay. Um, what's a funny view? The... The, the vegan vegetarian world is full of funny views. Um, people give Al Gore a very hard time. Bless his heart, our former vice president, Al Gore, Nobel Prize, right? 
uh, a, um, a, what's the name of the film? Inconvenient Truth. Al is, many people consider him saintly for his championing of environmental issues. And he does a lot of good. He wakes people up in a major way. He lives on a cattle ranch. Al Gore lives on a cattle ranch. He's a meat eater. And people go, hey, Al, you're a hypocrite. <laughs> you want to really do something? Start telling people to eat vegetables. Plant strong, not meat strong. And it's not the case that people don't tell him, but he, he's got a view, you know. And he lit, his parents raised, he grew up on a cattle ranch. He lives on a cattle ranch. What are you going to do? That's a view, right? It's deeply entrenched. And um, which brings me I didn't have time to print it out, but I wanted to share with you. To feed four billion more skip meat, milk, and eggs, study says. This is NBC News Science Desk from August 5th. Uh, this came about because in London in August, they were taste testing laboratory grown hamburgers. Remember the summer that came up? Um, who else? Uh, Sergey Brin, right? Google, one of the co founders of Google, is uh, championing laboratory grown beef for hamburgers. So, no cow involved, right? The lab-grown burger taste tested Monday in London is billed as one way to avert a looming food crisis by freeing up the agricultural resources used to feed billions of cattle each year. Another way to avert the crisis is to stop eating animal products altogether, according to a recent survey. Thank you very much, recent survey. In fact, Emily Cassidy, a researcher at the Institute on the Environment at University of Minnesota, it's important when the researchers at Minnesota start talking about that because why? Much, 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 much of the research from Monsanto comes from Minnesota. It's a major ag research campus, as is Davis, right? Iowa, Minnesota, University of California, Davis. So, in fact, quote, we find that doing a complete radical shift away from grain-fed animals and stop producing biofuels that you can increase calorie availability enough for 4 billion people. Emily Cassidy, a researcher at Institute of the Environment, University of Minnesota, told in NBC News, she and colleagues examined 41 major crops grown around the world which account for more than 90% of global food production to find out how much food is being produced and how it's being used. Okay. She and colleagues, they looked at 41 major crops around the world, which is like 90% of the crops that exist. How is it made? How is it being used? They found 36% of the calories produced are used for animal feed. One out of three, right? One out of three of the soybean, corn, wheat grown in the world goes to animals, and then you eat the animals. Of these, 12% make their way to the human diet as meat and animal products. Another 4% of human edible calories are used to produce biofuels. So, what's the, what do you put in the tank? Bio, it's a biodiesel, right? Growing all those crops for direct human consumption instead increases available food calories by up to 70%. That's an additional 4 billion people can be fed on existing farmland. 4 billion people compared to who can eat the meat if you put it into cows and pigs. Not so many. Okay. Um, that's more than the 2 to 3 billion people scientists expect the planet to add by 2050. 2012, 2050, 38 years. Two to three billion people are on their way in the next 28 years. 
um, it's pretty unrealistic to just expect everyone to drastically reduce their animal product consumption and to stop producing corn ethanol. That's the word I was looking for. Between the status quo of today and a meat, milk, and egg-free diet is a middle ground that can feed hundreds of millions of additional people with existing cropland. All it takes is a shift away from beef towards chicken and pork. Oh, that's good. Which convert grain to meat more efficiently than cattle, she said. Well, she's realistic, trying to get people away from the worst of As for the lab-grown burger, Cassidy said, the research is really fascinating. For now, though, the $330,000 hamburger, cost $330,000 for that burger, tasted in London, is not the kind of thing that's yet to market and certainly not affordable to most people. <laughs> Scientific American article of August, uh, where's the date of this one? August 12th, hamburgers will not feed the world, says the article from Scientific American. We have to change. There must be differences in consumption. Small shifts in crop allocation may be needed. Scientific American, that very cautious scientific language. So, views. What are views? The view is we need a lot of protein and the best protein is in meat. <coughs> Untrue. Was it ever true? It, it was the opposite was never tested. Except, if you look around, what do you discover? You know what happened in Denmark during World War II? It's a very interesting story. So, here's the view. If you want to get your kid to Stanford, you've got to feed him lots of McDonald's, Big Macs. You want to get your kid the first chair violin, they've got to eat a lot of meat. It's the only healthy food to get your kid to succeed the way you want him to succeed. Right? Push your kid to success so you can have a kid at Stanford. What do you do? Feed them lots of meat because that's the best food for humans, for winners. Winners eat meat. Losers eat plants. I want my kid to get to Stanford so I'm feeding him lots of plants. Nobody says that, right? Okay. Interesting. What happens is people who eat lots of meat get sick and die. Rip Esselstyn, fireman, engine number two in University of Texas, Austin, where there's lots of overweight folks because they eat Tex-Mex cooking. He goes out on fire calls. How many of those fire calls actually have to do with fires? 10%. One out of 10 calls to the firehouse are for a fire. What are the other nine? They are for heart attacks. Heart attacks. Time after time. And they put the cameras in the cab of the, of the engine. They ring the siren. They hit the bell. They go steering through the streets, right through the red lights, right? They pull up. Here's some overweight guy laid out on the crosswalk with his grocery bag scattered all around him. Close to death. They jump out. They scoop him up. They take him to the hospital, to emergency room, over and over again. He's had a coronary incident. And, as Rip says, it's always excessive cholesterol leading to coronary artery disease. He says, never do they write in the cause of death broccoli and tofu. Never. It's not the case. Firemen of the world are the first responders, firemen of America. They're out there because we're killing ourselves by mouth, right? Because of what we eat. That's the case. Okay, so Denmark, World War II, Germans march in, the Danes 
don't f- resist bringing them criticism, but it turned out to save the country. What did the Germans do? The Germans took all the meat for their military to feed the German soldiers. Suddenly, the Danes had no access to meat. All the meat was taken by the Germans. They sh- good Danish meat. Give it to the soldiers. Go fight the Russians. What did the Danes have to eat? Anything that wasn't meat. For five years, there was no meat in Denmark. None. Right? No meat. No beef, no pork, no chicken. What happened to the public health statistics in Denmark? You look at the graph. No heart attacks. No cancer, no high blood pressure, no diabetes. They just fell like that. Suddenly, within nine months, heart attacks went away. Heart disease went away in Denmark. It was not an issue for public health, and they keep good statistics. Okay, 1945, the Germans are defeated. Meat comes back into production. Guess what happened? Nine months later, heart attacks, high blood pressure, cholesterol, cancer goes right up. For five years, the public health statistics in Denmark look like this. Five years later, they go right back up. Utterly caused by what they eat. Okay, that's a view, right? We say meat is the the best source of protein and we need lots of protein. As it says, yi mie, jin mie, dang mie, right? Have gone bad, are now going bad, or will go bad. How funny, but we really believe that, right? You see these big silverback gorillas, right? They're plant eaters. There's, uh, what's his name, Bizarro? Peraro, Dan Peraro, this wonderful c- cartoonist who's an animal rights activist and a vegan. Dan Peraro, he's got... This, this little monkey down here looking at the big silverback gorilla. The monkey goes, yeah, well, what do you do for protein? He said, because silverbacks are vegetarians. So. Where do you get your protein? Okay, so those are views. An arrow, the arrows of, of what? Arrogance and views. We can't extinguish the fire of greed, hatred, and stupidity. It's hard to do it on your own because the marketplace will tell you that greed, anger, and stupidity are what wins. Boy, oh boy, oh boy. We'll, um, we'll stop at this point um, to, to talk about greed at, the <coughs> at this moment in America is really poignant. Um, the you know, we don't do politics here, but we do do culture. And America um, has been spying on the world. Not only our own citizens, but citizens of other countries, leaders of other countries. And it's now public knowledge. Poor John Kerry, our new Secretary of State. You all know that Hillary is no longer Secretary of State, right? John Kerry, the former war hero, former political a presidential candidate, became Secretary of State just when Edward Snowden released the statistics about national security administrations, spying, listening, wiretapping, listening to everybody, and it's fact. He's got a hard job. He has to apologize. He goes to these countries carrying America's flag, and they go, you've been listening to our president, Merkel of Germany, right? Argentina. And he's got to go, well, yeah, uh, you must understand that it's uh, in the interests of America to uh, find out what you had for lunch. Mm. It's tough. What a tough job he has. My goodness. So is that greed or is that anger? We don't know. We know a finger of ten fingers of the whole story. And what they're saying is that those wiretapping, um, the, the algorithms and the data that's collected is operating on autopilot. 
a lot. They just start it and it just sucks up everything. And that's what Snowden was telling people was to stop it. You'd have to reprogram it because this program, once it's out there, yeah, well, somebody says, sure, why not? Why eliminate them? We need to listen. They might be harboring terrorists. So it's just, you know, it's, is that greed or is it anger or is it stupidity? Well, it turned to anger. Maybe it was greed at the start for doing something that probably we wouldn't want done to us. Have somebody listen in on us. And so we listen in. On, we know it's not right, but we do it anyway. And somebody says yes. And so, sure. Let's listen to Canada. Let's add Mexico. Well, what do you say? Let's listen to England. Yeah. So, what about that? You know, greed, anger, and delusion. The fires of greed. It's burning like a fire. How do you stop that kind of that that kind of uh, acquisitive impulse once it gets going? Interesting, huh? So that's greed, right? You know you shouldn't, and you go ahead. Mingzhi gu fan. You know you shouldn't, and you go ahead. What about that? At some point, you say, "We shouldn't do this." Seventeen thousand nuclear warheads. That's plenty, enough, right? Let's add a few more. How about a couple more thousand nuclear warheads? Our nuclear stockpiles. Is that greed, anger, or delusion? I don't know. I don't know. As a culture, who's doing it? Who's making those decisions? Good question. And I think the Buddha's answer would be nobody. But greed, anger, and delusion will manifest in a variety of ways. The trick is to recognize it in my mind. What did I say yes to today that I knew I shouldn't do? Right? And at what point does it become something that increases anger? That's a question everybody will have the chance to ask themselves probably every day. Right? So if you can find a single day where greed has not arisen and given you a chance to um, challenge it, you're doing good. That's a day of little affliction. So here's our bodhisattva looking at living beings, stepping back and saying, look at these creatures. My goodness, I sure hope they wake up because... We're in trouble. You're going to be coming around again and a lot of pain in between. I hope you know a good dentist. All right. We will transfer the mirror at this point and... The Chronicle tonight said 10,000 victims of the, the super typhoon in the, the Philippines. So never underestimate the power of a concentrated mind to do good in the midst of suffering. When the room is really dark, even a match shows up bright. And uh, a mind concentrated on goodness is powerful light. When people do it together, 
it's a bright light. So if we can transfer merit, it's not insignificant at all. Here we go. So sing because you got a tooth out at least you can play but what's your excuse did you get lose it all right never mind what i wanted to say to you was i don't want to hear any more complaints about teeth right you know a good orthodontist i could use a phone number because uh 
when we have tooth problems, it's a big deal. Yours doesn't amount to much, all right? So relax. Okay, thank you. Jeez, I mean. True. I was going to stop at 9, and I'm going to do that. So, omi tofu. We are um, moving into a week of uh, pretty much regular schedule. What other events are going on this week? Anything? Yes. Round table is coming up Thursday night. Good. Anybody who would like to come sit, meditate, and discuss topics, uh, pertinent topics with the monks, please come Thursday and turn left when you get in the front door. Uh, we sit in the dining room on the floor, and uh, people uh, come back week after week, so must, something good must be going on. Um, it's uh, a chance to actually listen to the uh, listen to each other and develop your ideas uh, in a way that you don't get to during the week because mostly topics change uh, when you're in a conversation. People just everyone chips in, and you can't really focus on any idea longer than about three exchanges, right? So at Roundtable, we get a chance to uh, hear different voices uh, go deep on topics. And it's, uh, it's never the same twice. The chemistry is whatever you bring to it. So please do come on 7, 7.30. Uh, young people, if you're 60 years old, we won't kick you out, but you may feel old, you know, sitting there. Because uh, it's, originally it was intended for college students. You know. But uh, you won't be... We won't check your ID at the door to see if you're too old. You might be carded to see if you're too old. Right? Um, okay, how many folks online, Jerry? 20 to 25 people listening online. When we started tonight, there were more people online than there were in the room. And I think there's 25 people on the balcony right now, so it's great. We're going to have to expand our balcony, maybe move some of those boxes because the seats are at a premium up there now, so... Great. Okay, so any reports from Highway 9? What happened? Mm -hmm. We have a cabin down in the, the uh, Santa Cruz Redwoods. Okay, uh, there's a cabin near Boulder Creek on Highway 9, and uh, it's been full of mold and mildew because it's on the yin side of the hill, and it gets really damp down there in the San Lorenzo Valley. So uh, some volunteers went down today to, to paint out the mold and mildew. Does it sm smell nicer inside now? Great. Okay. Yeah. Say again? Woozy from the... Tomas, you got pain in your hair. So. <laughs> Is that a sign from above? You ate some pain? You aged a few. I thought you said you ate some pain. Not, not again. Yeah. So. Guoji had war paint on. That's his war paint. You sh that's when he goes... Right. Yeah. You saw the real Guji there, yeah. Great. Okay. Yeah, potentially that will become a retreat space for the Berkeley Monastery community and the San Jose community as well, San Francisco, because um, it's under the, the world's largest living things, redwoods, and it's a very special space. I lived there for almost two years at one point and uh, benefited greatly by learning humility uh, underneath those very large living beings. So, yep. All right. So, Shi Dao Zi Jin, Fei Dao Zi Tui, Zai Shan Er Cong, Bu Shan Er Gai. See you next week.
bow in respect to the venerable master.